I'm a cameraman at a film editor. Most of the films I make are sponsored films, nuts and bolts films, they're called. Occasionally, I'm asked to do a travel film or an adventure film, and I jump at the chance. About 10 years ago, a writer, John Weld, and I collaborated on a film about a Basque sheep herder who came here from Spain on contract. We needed a technical advisor about herding sheep and about Basques. We were lucky. Meet the man we found. My name is Gene Yurity. I live in Grand Junction, Colorado. This is my wife, Benny. This is my house. I first came to the United States in 1925. My first job was herding sheep. I'm still in the sheep business today. Herding sheep was the way many Basque boys got their start in America. This is our story. John Weld and Gene Urity and I put the film together. But that wasn't the end of the story. Gene Urity is the story I'm about to tell you now. The western slope of the Pyrenees between France and Spain is the homeland of the Basques, an indigenous race of people that seem to have always been there. And indeed that may be true, as we shall investigate later in this story. It is the year 1925, and a young French Basque is tending his herd of sheep. His name is Jean Urity. His home and his family live near the town of saint jean pierre de port a short distance from the French border. In his wildest dreams, Jean could not know what the next 50 years hold in store for him. Generations of living off the land has given young Basques the confidence and the knowledge to endure the hardships of living by oneself in remote mountain areas for long periods of time. This is why the Basques are sought after all over the world for this task. And so it was no surprise when Jean's brother brought him a letter with a contract to herd sheep for a distant relative in some place called Colorado. Jean soon found himself on the way to America and the Colorado Rockies. But not without the help of some kind soul at Ellis Island who steered him to the Grand Central Station and the right train to the west. The Basque temperament is one of acceptance. This is the way it is. I'm on my way. And I'll get there and I'll do the job. Must have gone through his head as this big, raw country rolled by before his eyes. Strange people, nobody to talk to or even understand him. All he wanted to do was earn $5,000 and return to the Pyrenees in France and start a blacksmith shop. However, surprises came in the form of indignities against this immigrant who spoke a strange language. He couldn't get in the dining car and the train without a necktie. And it's a long, long trip from New York to Price, Utah. So a very hungry young man got off the train where his cousin Grace was waiting. A few days rest and Gene was busy learning the ropes of a Colorado sheep herder. He chose a white horse for good luck and watched and learned about the pack mules that would carry his supplies to the high country. He became used to his dog who would share the next few months with him. He adopted a motherless lamb which quickly adopted him. A camp mover acted as his guide in the unfamiliar mountains of Colorado, but only for a few days. In 1925, it was still the wild, wild west. Gene, the sheep herder, was now on his own. When he left the ranch in the lowlands, he had a gun, 
a sheepdog and a horse, and some provisions. He might not see anybody for months. There were no roads, no pickup truck every week or so with fresh supplies. It was just Gene and his herd of sheep. Oh, yes, and some coyotes and maybe a hungry bear. And something else that he had never experienced in the Pyrenees of southern France, cowboys. They hated sheepmen, claimed the sheep ruined the grass, tried to run him off the range. Even killed some of his sheep. Gene thought of retaliation. Even the point of shooting the cattle came to mind. But the Basque love of life and nature ruled otherwise, and he put his gun down. After living the life of a lonely sheepman for 10 years, Jean met and courted and married Benny Velasquez, a charming young Spanish lady from Trinidad, Colorado, whose family had lived there since colonial days. She, too, shared the frustrations of being different. In lieu of a honeymoon and to settle a $4,000 debt owed to Jean, they got an old hotel in Grand Junction. They cleaned it, modernized it, and ran the enterprise by themselves. Benny was the hotel maid and the day clerk. And when the sheep could spare Jean, he was the night clerk. In the 20 years they ran the hotel, they profited over $200,000. The money they could spare from everyday living expenses went into land, some for commercial property, some for farmland, and of course, pasture land for his friends as sheep. Some of that pasture land they purchased was right where the Aspen Airport is today. The Colorado Rockies are the best for his sheep in the summertime. But when the winter comes, Gene and his sheep prefer the flatlands of Utah. So Jean, in the late 30s, purchased some land around Moab. Just by paying the back taxes, Jean and Benny got some 10,000 acres. Well, this venture was the turning point for Jean and Benny. Some men from the oil companies were out prospecting for black gold. And would it be all right if they looked around his acreage? Jean said no. Sheep and trucks don't mix. They wouldn't go away. The oil men persisted. Gene countered with all kinds of restrictions. The sheep have the right of way. No noise. Don't rip up the land. They agreed, and so in a few years, Gene and Benny had 44 free-flowing oil wells, and later on royalties from a refinery the oil people built. And remember the grazing land that Gene had bought in the Colorado Rockies? That happened to be near Aspen, Colorado. That went for $500,000. Did all this change Gene and Benny? Yes, it did, but not the way you would think. They had a nice home in a modest neighborhood in Grand Junction. Gene decorated the backyard with pioneer relics he had picked up over the years of herding sheep. He had his own blacksmith shop. He had been an apprentice blacksmith as a youth in France. But what about all that money? Jean built a house in St. jean pierre de port for his mother and sister, who had been a seamstress for Christian Dior for over 30 years in Paris. He set up his brother in a shoe factory in Bayonne. He made many gifts of money, large and small, to friends and relatives in the Basque provinces. He felt that the Basques, French and Spanish, were misunderstood, downgraded, in spite of their ancient heritage. In America, they were just sheep herders. He brought dance groups and musicians from the Basque provinces to Colorado just to change the image. He built a highlight court and a handball court and picnic grounds at his farm near Grand Junction, where many Basque parties and celebrations are held to keep alive the old Basque customs. 
Gene Urity and his wife provide scholarships to Basque students. Gene and Benny have made many trips to the Basque homeland in the Pyrenees, sometimes taking less fortunate children with them. What Gene was trying to preserve was the old-fashioned provincial way of life. In spite of his well-deserved fortune, his life did not change. He liked the simple, real pleasures of life and living. And so did Benny. She had the time to follow a creative urge and became an excellent artist. Her many paintings show a great variety of subjects and a lot of talent and technique. These are only a few. Another thing that Gene wanted to do involved yours truly. He wanted America to see his native land, the Pyrenees Mountains. The seven provinces of the Basque people in southern France and northern Spain. We made two trips to film the natural ancient beauty and the provincial way of life of these delightful people, the Basques. Jean died at home at 79 before the film was finished. Benny and I want this film to be a tribute to one Jean Urity a pioneer of the Old West, a sheep herder, and a fantastic person, a Basque. From the peaks of the Pyrenees, west to the Atlantic Ocean, lives a unique race of people, not French, not Spanish, but over the centuries have kept this unique quality alive, that quality being an independent spirit. Some have migrated to the Americas, some are in Australia and South Africa. Wherever they go, they make a mark for themselves. They are the Basques. In this film, we're going to visit them in their homeland just to define the boundaries of their territory Let's look at a map of northern Spain and southern France. There are seven provinces, three in France and four in Spain. Not a large territory, none of it more than 100 miles from the Bay of Biscay. The very land you are looking at now was the battleground of many invasions, Huns, Visigoths, Vandals, Moors. But through it all, the Basques were steadfast. Their land was never taken by the invaders and except for political boundaries, still remains in the hands of that ancient race, the Basques. Neither the land nor the people has been defiled. Whenever the word Basque is heard in scholarly circles, a discussion always starts. Where did they come from? What about the Basque language? What are its roots? In this film, we are not going to solve any racial riddles. We're simply going to portray the lives and times of a group of people who have maintained a single bloodline for all the time of recorded history. And how much before, we can only guess. Oh, there's evidence to prove a relation between the Basques and the cave dwellers who created the paintings found in caves near their territory. There are the ancient dolmen still standing, sepulchers for dead leaders, all facing to admit sunshine. But the most comprehensive fact is a surprising similarity of the measurement of skulls found in Stone Age dwellings and those of modern Basques. Very little intermarriage takes place outside Basque bloodlines, so a purebred Basque is the rule, not the exception. Why is this? No reason. They just like each other. So much so that there are about a million or so living in the Basque provinces. The homes of the Basques are as traditional as the berets the men wear. We're on the French side now near the Basque town of saint jean pierre de port 200 year old houses are not uncommon. This is Jean's hometown, 
so we'll let him take us on a tour of homes. From peasant to elegant, the only difference seems to be the size. Solidly built of stone and mortar, the living quarters are on the second floor. The ground floor is home for the livestock. But in modern times, many families have traded the family cow for the family car. Winters in the Pyrenees Highlands can isolate a farm for weeks, so the animals share the protection of the family home. The second floor is also a protection from robbers. Jean drove me over to Spain to a little town called Navarnis, which is near Guernica. It is a small farming community with a church, a school, a few shops, and a bus connection to Guernica, only a few miles away. Most of the farmhouses have been in continuous use for two or three hundred years. In the springtime, not much time is spent in the house. In fact, very little time, because the cows and the sheep must be moved. The soil tilled and planted with potatoes and corn and commercial crops. Nature has given this part of the world a wonderful gift. Year-round rainfall makes irrigation unknown. One home we visited, the lady had no idea what we meant when we asked her how often she had to water her home garden. This is undoubtedly a family affair. No hired hands would work so hard. But a grove of young fruit trees will bring a good price if the trees are sold. And if the trees are not sold, the fruit they bear will show up at a weekly street market or even be shipped to Madrid or exported to Paris. With the rich soil and the abundance of sunlight and water, the fruits of their labor will be rewarded. I often wonder why anyone would want to leave all this and go where you can't even speak the language. This looks to me like a harmonious blend of man and nature. Many generations ago, there were fewer Basques, and the farms were bigger. In those days, the eldest son inherited the whole estate. But old customs change, and the big farms are being divided among all the children. With this rural background, which needs no definition, let me borrow some words concerning the Basque character from an eloquent writer, Rodney Gallup, from The Book of the Basques. Here are some impressions of Basque character. Loyalty and rectitude. Dignity and reserve. Independence and a strong sense of race and racial superiority. A serious outlook tempered by a marked sense of humor and a capacity for enjoyment. Deep religious feeling and a cult of tradition amounting almost to ancestor worship. All these correlated and directed by a deep-rooted simplicity and a courageous, objective view of life. As we drove around the Basque country, I was impressed with the quiet beauty of the landscape, the way the home seemed to be placed in exactly the right spots to create a pleasing picture. Why is this landscape so different from, let's say, in Southern California? Here is the reason that Jean and I arrived at. 200 years or more ago, when many of these houses were built, the only earth movers they had were a pick and a shovel. So you chose a fairly level area. In other words, the location of the house was compatible with the natural surroundings. And that is a fundamental Basque principle. Do not change the way it is. Adjust yourself to the environment. 
And if you're lucky, there will be enough stones in the nearby earth to build your home. The new homes being built copy the same style as the older places. The heavy wooden shutters for the windows are picturesque, but they're also very practical. They not only conserve heat, when winter storms rage, the inside of the house is dry and snug. The tile and slate roofs withstand the high winds that blow in from the Atlantic and seldom need repairing. Sheep are a big economic factor in the lives of the Basques. Not so much for the wool, but for sheep's milk. The entire Roquefort cheese industry depends upon a constant supply of this milk. Most of the milk comes from small herds of sheep owned by individual families. But an enterprising Basque who lives on the border between France and Spain employs milking machines adapted to sheep for a herd of 500 ewes. A special bread of long-haired sheep thrive here. The long fleece sheds the rain. Depending upon the weather, late in the spring, the sheep are moved up in the high Pyrenees to feed on the soft grass that has an effect on the quality of the wool. From the looks of things around here, I'm sure the sheep and the shepherd are looking forward to a long summer vacation. For a minute or so, let us look at scenes that haven't changed for a millennium. The music is 16th and 17th century compositions played by a Basque virtuoso of the harp, Nicanor Zabaleta. Again using the words of that English writer, Rodney Gallup, who in 1930 said, the Basque landscape, those blue mountains and green valleys, those golden maize fields and poplar bordered streams are to be found elsewhere but one could never mistake the aspect of the villages, clusters of whitewashed houses with chocolate beams and shutters and the scarlet gash of red peppers drying on the balconies, the Pelote Court, never more than a stone's throw from the church, which seems to collect the other buildings round it as a hen her chickens. Nor could one fail to recognize the disposition of the outlying farms, innumerable specks of white, each set on a hillock and turned towards the rising sun, the threshold hidden by the gently swelling curve of the land and reached by white paths that wind through green apple orchards or skirt a field of maize stubble. Fawn-colored oxen, quiet and gentle, dragging a creaking cart with solid wheels, goaded from before by a peasant whose shoulders are curved like the contours of his native hills and whose black beret, tilted up at the back, is pulled low over his eyes. There is another side to this story of these ancient people. The environment of nature is one thing. It's fairly constant. But the world of people is fickle. It is ruled by economics, by politics, by changing times. Up till now, we've seen a storybook life hitched to a horse cart. To see how the Basque people have weathered the Industrial Revolution, and let's not forget the Franco Revolution in Spain, we'll start at the Bay of Biscay, where the Pyrenees slope down to the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Playa Laida. There are several fishing ports near here. One secluded little port to the north goes by the name of Ea. When we were there, everyone must have been out fishing, not a boat in the harbor. But to the west, we saw lots of action. This is the port of Bermeo. Those Basques who live near the sea have always gone to sea, and not just for local fish. At least 400 years ago, the Basques were the kingpin of the whaling industry. At first, the whales were caught offshore from France and Spain and Portugal. 
And as the whales moved farther north, so did the Basques. Leaving from these very ports of Leque Itio, Bermeo, Ondaroa, and Saint Jean de Luz in France, they traveled north and west in wooden ships built by Basques. The trail of the whale led them farther and farther away, past Ireland and Iceland and Greenland, and down the coast of Labrador. Recently, the Canadian government has discovered a port on the Labrador coast known as Red Bay, where the Basque whaling business thrived. But all that was a long time ago. The Basques surely qualify as world-class fishermen. Today, they own and operate fleets of refrigerated long-distance tuna boats. What you see here are boats that fish the coastal waters of the Atlantic for anchovies, sardines, and smelts. To get to the fishing banks offshore is usually a two-day round trip. As you can see, this is more than a family affair. The whole town of Bermeo is here, and everybody has something to do. kilometers east is the fishing port of Ondaroa, and rain or shine, it's business as usual, and business is good. In this observer's opinion, I would say that the bass came out a winner when faced with the Industrial Revolution, just as he was a winner when whaling was in. While this boatload of sardines is offloaded, let me continue the story of the bass whaling operation as it has come to light recently. This happened 400 years ago in Labrador at a place now called Red Bay. Relics of the operation tell the story and include a well-preserved sunken bass whaling ship. In the year 1565, the San Juan was caught in a violent storm in the harbor just before leaving on the long voyage home. This is how the operation worked. The whales were harpooned and killed off the coast of Labrador by Basques in seven-man whale boats called chalupas. They then towed the whale to Red Bay, where the whale blubber was rendered and put into wooden casks. A ship could carry as much as 50,000 gallons of whale oil, much prized at that time for lighting and medicinal use. At today's values, it was worth from four to six million dollars. The Basque's love affair with the sea goes even farther back in time, back to the time of Columbus. Juan de la Cosa, master and owner of the Columbus flagship, Santa Maria, is thought to be a Basque, as were several members of the ship's crew. And also, Juan Elcano, master of a ship in Magellan's Round the World Expedition. When Magellan was killed in the Philippines, Elcano took over the leadership and thus was the first to circumnavigate the world. Eight kilometers west from Ondaroa is another Basque fishing port, Lake Itio. This port too is involved with offshore fishing and the catch is sold locally or to canneries or moved fresh to markets in Spain and France. Because of the close-knit family relationship between Basque, I feel certain that there are blood ties between the very hardy fishermen we see in front of my camera and the whalers of the 10th and 11th centuries. In fact, in the seal of arms of the town of Lake Itio, one can see a whale spouting and a whale boat in pursuit. Rodney Gallup tells us, in olden times, a watcher was posted on a tower at the shoreline. As soon as he saw a whale spouting, he set fire to a pile of wet straw at the top of the tower. And at the sound of drums, the fishermen would put to sea, 10 or 12 in a boat, and attack the monster. The change from agriculture to industry in Spain is very graphic in the little town of Lesaca, about two kilometers off the highway that runs from Hendaye to Pamplona. Where there was once a little village, there is now a steel rolling mill. 
the Spanish Basques have taken advantage of the fact that the main iron ore deposits in Spain are in the Basque provinces. Today the steel industry of Spain is in good hands, the Basques. With an expanding population, the Basques cannot possibly continue to live the lifestyle of their forefathers. But this is a good solution to an increasing problem. Rather than move to the city, bring industry to the village. Also notice a change from the basic house to multiple dwellings. In this instance, there seems to be a bit of the Basque character in the apartment house. I like that. We are headed west for the old established industrial center of Spain, which is in the Basque province of Vizcaya. On our way, we saw other examples of rural factories springing up. The cows don't mind at all, and I'm sure the growing Basque families around here don't either. The heart of the steel industry is in Bilbao, about 15 kilometers from the Bay of Biscay. A number of steel plants from basic iron smelting to steel fabrication are located in or near Bilbao. This is also a shipbuilding center and has been ever since steel replaced wooden ships. This is a much older city and the housing along the river near Vion reflects the age but that too is changing. Not far from town, one can see apartment buildings with a bright facade coming up like mushrooms on a green hillside. These look like elegant apartments. Where do the people work that live in these modern high-rise places? The answer is, not far away are imposing new industrial plants with ancient Basque names over the door. Downtown Bilbao has had a facelift too. High-rise buildings, shade trees on parkways. All this is possible because the banking business in Spain is handled by, you guessed it, the Basques. So the answer to the question, how did the Basques fare in the Industrial Revolution? I would say, very well. Capital of Vizcaya. And while we look at the famous oak of Guernica, we are reminded that Vizcaya has been a continuous state since the earliest reference in the 8th century. But time rolls on, and in the 20th century, we are witnessing a blend of the old days and the new ways of life. A nice nostalgic view of the old days can be seen on the plaza any day. And on such a sunny day, what better place to take your baby for a stroll? How long has it been since you've seen a town clock made of flowers? And there are park benches, all filled with interesting people, with stories to tell. And I might add, very willing to tell you their story. And of course, there's a fountain. No, those people are not in the fountain. They're on the other side. See, what did I tell you? There is a little hill just outside Guernica that shows the whole picture. First, the old town. And beyond that clump of trees at the outskirts of Guernica, an industrial complex, all owned and operated by the local Basque residents. It's another example of Basque enterprise. And because the Basque population is increasing, new apartments are being built. It's a new way of life for a lot of folks. Jean and I talked about it. Jean pointed out that it is the Basque nature to change with the change. So whether it is a change in the weather or a change in the environment, the Basque changes accordingly. Even if you're four stories up, you can dry your clothes in the sun. 
We're going back to Jean's hometown, St. John Pierre de Port, in the French Basque province of Basque Navarre. This town with the Basque name of Daniban Garitsi. A literal translation means a little way from the port. Politically, it has gone from France to Spain to France. 300 years ago, it was fortified by order of Louis XIV to Grand Marshal Vauban, who called it my jewel city. And that's what it is today. It is a stronghold of the Basque language. The ancient language was banned in Spain by the Franco Revolution. But since the death of Franco, the 1978 Constitution has now approved a Basque government and schools in the Basque capital at Vitoria, Spain. But St. John never had that problem. <laughs> it is early in the morning on Monday. It is market day. On this day each week, farmers from miles around bring livestock, sheep and cows and pigs to sell or trade. Sharp buyers from Paris seldom get the best of the deal here. If the Basque doesn't get his price, back he goes to the hills with his sheep or calves. The livelihood of the French Basque is rooted in the earth. There is no industry here such as you see in the Spanish Basque land. In France, it is agricultural rather than industrial. This does not mean that the French Basques are different. They have adapted to the local environment, like those Basques who live near the sea became fishermen, and the Basques who mined the iron ore became industrialized. And I might also say, those Basques who migrated to foreign lands and strange surroundings quickly adapted to the new environment, but they brought with them their heritage of vitality and ingenuity. St. Jean-Pierre de Port is a delightful French Basque village. Quiet streets just a block away from the main thoroughfare where you will find a post office. A boulangerie with a goodly supply of those long, crusty loaves of bread. small shops. A town clock, a covered bridge over the river Neve. paved with little square blocks to form patterns. But what intrigued me most about this town was the faces of the townspeople. They were happy, alert, bright faces, all expressing joie de vivre. And that goes for the young ones and the old ones. interested in what I was doing as I was in capturing their expressions.
day, I was witness to a whole fleet of mobile stores that move from town to town throughout France. And this is the day they stopped at St. Jean. The carnival-like displays are set up on the main street, so let's snoop around and see what's new. They don't sell many of these. This is Black Beret country. surplus of homegrown fruits and vegetables are welcome to display and sell their produce. And that goes for chickens, chicks, and ducks as well. Everyday grocery shopping, most people in St. Jean patronize a supermarket called Una that sells a variety of canned goods, frozen foods, fresh vegetables, dairy products, cheeses, a good selection of cut meats, wines, desserts, so not every family supplies all its own needs. The prices are approximately the same as we pay in the U.S., which makes it kind of rough on those with a lower income. But I think they get better mileage out of their food dollars. <laughs> Pardon me, I mean food francs. The Basques, in this respect, are like most small town residents of France. They most probably have a kitchen garden and a way of getting excellent meals out of less expensive cuts of meat. While we're on the subject of food, I'd like to talk about Basque restaurants. Basque restaurants have a unique style. And if you've eaten at a Basque restaurant in Western United States, you know what I mean. They're all the same pattern. The guests eat at common tables, usually 10 or 12 people. A couple of large bowls of delicious hot soup are on the table waiting for you when you sit down. Then, without referring to a menu, you are served a fish course, possibly trout if you are inland, or an ocean fish if you're on the coast, and prepared tastefully in a French provincial manner. If it's that time of the year, your next course will be lamb roasted to perfection with lots of garlic, French bread, sweet butter, bowls of fresh vegetables, and bottles of wine that never have a bottom. This course is followed by a cool, crisp salad, and then fresh fruit and platters of exquisite cheeses. The Basque and the French custom hereabouts is to serve the large meal of the day around one or two o'clock, and the evening meal possibly an omelet made with leftovers from the midday meal. Breakfast is usually quite light, café light and a croissant. This is what market day looks like if it's a rainy day in St. Jean Pierre de Port.
obviously, in order to survive and exist in this modern workaday world, one must work. We saw that the Spanish Basques became industrialized. Now let's look at the French Basques. Agriculture is a mainstay. With the rich soil and the warm sun and the gentle rains, anything will grow. Grass for the sheep and the cows, corn for the pigs. Over the centuries, the Pyrenees Mountains have been stripped of trees. Now, all that land has been planted with young trees. Some areas are ready for harvest. And of course, a replanting program is underway to maintain the forests. And the resulting spin-off is a new industry, a lumber mill. Another crop that does well in southern France is grapes. And you know what people do with grapes. I mean besides eating them. They make wine. are made from grapes grown on the lush hills surrounding St. John Pierre de Port. Here the soil and the sun and the rain blend together to make a fine crop of grapes that makes a superb wine. small winery run by a Basque family that has been in the winemaking business for generations. There is a rapport between the grape growers and the wine master so that the grapes are picked at the peak of excellence. Sorry to say it doesn't get very far from this valley, but if you come across a bottle that looks like this, buy it. You'll love it. In Bayonne, they make a brandy called Izarra, which is distilled from locally grown grape wine. This too is a Basque creation using herbs and flowers and formulated hundreds of years ago in this same area. Izarra is renowned the world over and is akin to cognac, a very well-known French brandy. Bayonne is also the home of a shoe factory, which is run by a member of Jean's family. Shoes are a popular export item. Many Basques are employed by this enterprise. So 
from my observations, I would say the Basques on both sides of the French and Spanish border are doing very well. But Basque folklore is alive and doing very well, too. We're going to devote the rest of this film to see things the way they used to be. Jean and his sister Annette and I are on our way to Polombier, literally a place of doves, about 10 kilometers south and east of saint jean pierre de port near the little village of Lecumberi. These Basques, hunters or trappers if you will, snare wild pigeons in flight with suspended nets, the same as fish nets. This has been going on for centuries, and to my knowledge, the only place on earth where it happens. The pigeons are in migration from Scandinavia, Holland, and Belgium in the fall as birds head for Africa and the wheat fields of Algeria. fly low through the passes in the Pyrenees. This pass is called the Col de Lizarieta. Twelve and only twelve homesteads have the right to snare the birds, and they share and share alike. The group, all Basques of course, are the Palombe Association. Lookouts are stationed several hundred yards away in the approach to the pass. The lookouts signal the trappers as the flocks of pigeons are spotted. Men in treetop blinds actually command the birds to fly low by loud yelling and sometimes by throwing round discs called zimbela, which appear like hawks or falcons to the migratory flock. is interesting to watch. As soon as a catch from one flock is harvested, the nets must be quickly raised as the next flock may be only minutes away. The nets are raised to about 30 feet high by a system of pulleys. Then the top net is raised. The top net is dropped after the birds hit the back net, and the birds are then unable to escape. The release cables are operated by levers from within a rock-covered blind. The nets are about 50 to 75 feet wide. For each bird caught, hundreds will evade the nets. This method of providing meat for the table was going on long before the invention of gunpowder and shotguns. weigh about a pound. It is now a commercial venture bringing 25 francs for live birds and 15 for dead birds. So the retrievers take care in untangling the bird. Once free of the nets, the bird is stuffed into a loose-fitting jacket. At the end of the day, the team equally divides the catch, and each member of the team has the option of keeping or selling his share. The operation is not unlike the crew of a fishing boat. However, the French government is considering banning the practice. Hola. Hola.
It is Sunday, and Jean, Annette, and I are on our way to a festival, no particular holiday, just a reason to get together. Here it is called a fiesta, lots of good eating and drinking and dancing. The Basques love dancing, always have. Some dances have not changed in hundreds of years. At that time, only the men danced, but now, as you will see, very young boys and girls have mastered the art of dancing. The musician is playing a three-hold flute, and at the same time plays a drum. Very historic, very authentic, very typical. Some dances have roots in religion, while others describe folklore. program, one has time for a glass of wine and a little socializing at an impromptu bar. This is October, but who cares? The Maypole dance is pretty any time of the year. called the wineskin dance, a very old dance with a story. The dancers with the poles, which represent gardeners' hoes, are going to work in the fields. The fellow with the wineskin is not quite up to going to work this morning, maybe a little too much wine. So between hoeing, the workers manage to put their fellow worker down, and I mean down. left the fiesta a little early because Jean had an appointment to audition some dancers and singers to appear in Colorado. This dance is one of the oldest and most renowned of all the Basque dances. It is the wine goblet dance, Danza Godelé. Historically, Zamal Zayn, the dancer with a lace decorated hobby horse, was the only one who could mount the glass of wine which is very difficult for him because he can see neither the glass nor his feet. But today, everybody gets in the act. It still isn't easy even if you can see your feet. Try it sometime. But I suggest you try it with a bottle of cheap wine and don't drink any of the wine before you try it.
are woven into the fabric of their history and also into their everyday life. The epics of their wars are in song as well as little ditties sung to children. The comfort them or just to entertain them. Let's listen to a couple of songs sung by a trio who were part of a group of entertainers being considered to perform at Basque festivals in the U.S. St. John for a little visit with an old friend of Jean's, Bernard Mendy, who owns a little hotel just outside of town. We arrived as they were finishing supper. We relaxed. And I enjoyed looking at the decor, the typical wall shelves with family heirlooms of hand-painted dishes. Copper gourmet cooking utensils that have served good Basque meals to countless travelers like us. This was our last night before leaving for the U.S., and as chestnuts were roasting in the fireplace, I reflected a bit about the Basques who never left home. Are they different from the Basque American, or the Peruvian Basque, or the Australian Basque? Not really. Because they are transplanted into a different soil, does not mean that they change. A rose is a rose is a rose wherever it grows. The Basque will adapt to a new environment even more readily than will other foreign-born people because it is his nature to accept and adjust to the environment wherever he finds himself. been a joy and a pleasure to bring this film story to you. I hope in some way you sense the feeling that I have that you have met some people who are not just independent, but are free spirits, rare birds in this world of conformity and stylized living. I wish them well in the next 10,000 years. The Basques. semi-documentary film of the life and times of Juan Gorospe, a young Basque. In this feature-length film, Juan is first seen in his native village, Navarnes, in the Spanish Pyrenees. Here, a look at the charming way of life of the Basque folk is shown. On his way to Colorado to fulfill a sheep herding contract, young Juan visits Pamplona, Spain, at the time of the running of the bulls, and sees the wild melee as the fighting bulls are turned loose in the streets. Next, a brief stop to see the sights of New York, and Juan is on his way to Grand Junction, Colorado. In the film, the sheep rancher for whom Juan will work is a real live sheep rancher, Gene Urity. Mr. Uriti's life story closely parallels that of Juan. He too came to America from the French side of the Pyrenees some 48 years ago on a contract to herd sheep. Mr. Uriti, besides taking the part of the rancher, was the technical director for the production. His knowledge of Basque folklore and sheep raising makes this film a true picture. The camera follows Juan into the high country of the Colorado Rockies as he tends his herd of 2,000 sheep. The lonely life of the sheep herder may soon become only a story of the vanishing west as fewer and fewer herds are driven above timberline 
due to rising costs. Because of this fact, the Basque sheep herder may well become a historical documentary. Not only is this a story of the sheep herder, but it also depicts the life cycle of sheep. Breeding and lambing and docking are shown on the sheep ranches of California. Gene Unity shows how to cook mountain oysters as well as the Basque way to cook trout. Juan prepares sheep herder bread in a Dutch oven. In fact, within an hour and a half of fast moving action, the audience has shown all there is to know about the sheep herder's way of life and the fascinating story of the life of sheep. While tending his herd in the Rockies, the young Basque is challenged by a marauding coyote. An eagle swoops down on the newborn lambs. And cowboys kill some of his sheep in a battle over grazing rights. But there are good times too, like the Basque picnic in Reno, Nevada, and catching trout by hand and letters from home and his love, Manuela. After faithfully fulfilling his contract, the Basque sheep herder returns to Navarre and his Spain and his girl for a surprise ending to this interesting film about a unique people. The film was produced in 16 millimeter color by International Films of Laguna Beach, California. According to the producer, John Weld, the Basque sheep herder will be enlarged to 35 millimeter for general theater distribution and translated into Spanish and possibly French for foreign showings. It is also being edited for television and an educational version is planned.